welcome back to the 196th episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex, and today we're going to be flipping through just two stories in the news section that are both about the amount of speech that is allowed in public discourse, whether that be in the old-fashioned newspapers or that be online. And of course, we'll end today with our daily delight, a story meant to leave you feeling positive and ready to take on the day. And this one, you know, this episode might be a little bit shorter than normal. want to try something new out just to see if it's a little bit more consumable for people so they can get their news very, very quickly. So our first story, actually, oh, look at me. I'm about to skip over the daily debate. So at the end of the day, no matter how horrific, how terrible, how mean someone's speech is online, how much should be permissible? Uh, We have these laws coming up in lots of different states and especially overseas that limit what you can say if it offends somebody, if it hurts their feelings. At what point is your need to be satisfied with how people treat you actually allowed to infringe upon somebody else's rights to say what they want, how they want it to be free of jail time? Is there a limit for you? Is there not a limit for you? I mean, based on who watches or listens to the podcast, I assume I have some idea, but I'd love to hear what everybody has to think. So throw it down in the comment section. So our first article comes from Daily Signal, another pathetic strike by journalists on the left, or another way to phrase that is leftist journalists. So you may be thinking, wait, Alex, what does this have to have to do with speech? Well, one of the main things that a lot of these news organizations have been facing very, very recently is the editorial board inside the company, whether this be the Wall Street Journal, you know, the New York Post, or the New York Times, they make a particular decision and then the people working underneath them don't agree. Maybe they decide that they don't want to hire a particular person to do a particular beat or the inverse is true. They don't want to fire someone who reported a story that the other members or the other journalists did not like very much. We've seen a few of these different uh, metastasizing cancers growing in some of these large news organizations. And these people, they exercise this willingness to speak out and try to pressure these editorial boards because they really do believe that they have power. And this is another example of that. When you go on a strike, it is saying to the employers, we have power, okay? We have power over you. The work won't get done without us. And the Daily Signal, as you heard in the title, they are calling it pathetic. They're outright saying, okay, hey, uh, your ego here is a little bit bigger than uh, it actually should be, and maybe you should rein yourself in a little bit. So I want to jump to one of the first paragraphs from the story. Quote, your job is to shape the dough. So he's making an analogy about them being workers at a pizza joint. Your job is to shape the dough and add the ingredients and slide that pizza into the oven so the customer can enjoy a hot meal. People come to the pizza restaurant you work at because they expect the pizzas to be delicious and made relatively quickly. You, however, have decided to put a little less effort in. Your pizzas take longer to make, and they are made poorly. As a result, the pizza place loses business, and it has less money to pay you. Layoffs are announced due to the budget constraints. In protest, you announce that you're going on strike until you're paid what you think you deserve. You tell the bosses you're too important to let go. After all, you don't see anyone else making pizzas with you. But all the while, it's your inferior work that causes the issues in the fireplace or in the first place. So you're probably like, Alex, wait, hold on. What does this have to do with anything that we were just talking about? So when a journalist or a journalist organization goes on strike, they're protesting, they're not doing their work. And obviously, this means that the bottom line is going to be hurt. It means that the people who are decided to stay on afterwards may not be able to get paid as much because the quarterly earnings are down. And when you're doing exactly what these journalists are doing, trying to limit the amount of speech 
that has been present or is allowed on the platform, when you are trying to get rid of people who you may not necessarily agree with, who you actually really passionately disagree with, and you don't want their stories at the New York Times, at the Wall Street Journal, at the Washington Post, guess what you're doing? You're limiting the spectrum of different points of views that are allowed to be talked about at these different places. What happens if the New York Post only becomes an outlet that speaks to one side of the political aisle, that only speaks to half of the population. Guess what? You are losing out on revenue that could be coming from the other half of the population. So these sort of activities, these sort of activist movements that are brought on by uh, your ideology or just the fact that you don't like somebody else who may be writing on something that is important to talk about you, but you don't gr agree the way that they're covering it or that the perspective they have on a whole bunch of issues then you are being, I don't, know, I don't want to use the curse word, you are being a real pain in the butt to the people at the top who are saying, no, no, we need to speak to a diversity of people, the editorial boards that decide to defend these people. And also you're wasting valuable time worrying about the internal politics of your organization rather than doing your best job possible in order to put multiple opinions out there. Maybe if you don't like what they're saying, what you should do is write a well-researched, a well-sourced or a how should I say, a well-investigated article that counters exactly what they're saying. And if it's of high quality, guess what? That will pick up more readership. It will bring you personally more readership, but also you could have a back and forth between uh, the two writers who are doing this little thing. Maybe you guys have a monthly back and forth. You guys get dedicated columns or web pages, and then you have high-quality work that's getting disseminated to as many people as possible, therefore drawing in new eyeballs rather than trying to pull somebody else down down because they're doing something that you couldn't or you wouldn't do because you don't agree with it, You're go at the end of the day, you're hurting the bottom line of the company. And then when companies like Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal, I have listed them three times, four times now, all of these companies have had bottom line crunches, except maybe the New York uh, Times, but that's because they've started to diversify beyond just being a news organization. They were kind of a cultural organization now. That's what they're trying to do. But all of these companies have been in a bind. All of them have announced layoffs of some kind or rearranging of staff or certain pay cuts. So, and you're wondering, you know, the employees are wondering, why, why is this happening to us? It's because you're getting caught up in this BS and you're letting your ideology decide how you do your job rather than doing it to the best of your ability. And that's exactly what the Daily Signal is trying to call out here. There's another quote I want to read you. This is what it's like to be a liberal journalist striking at the Washington Post right now. According to a statement from the Washington Post Guild, a guild is a type of union entitled for white-collar employees, over 700 employees would walk, quote, off the job at midnight on December 7th for 24 hours. Why? Because the Post announced that budget constraints necessitate, necessitate laying off 40 employees and offered to buy out the contracts of 240 others. So what they're saying is, hey, you got another six months here and we, you know, we don't really want to pay you all that. We don't want to depend on the fact that we're going to make money in the future in order to pay you. How about we buy you out of your contract now? We don't have to worry about a renegotiation. We can just get you off the books and then we can take the loss in this quarter rather than having to uh, really spread out the pain, essentially, and say, okay, in six months, we're also going to have a loss in the books. Now, just take it now and then keep on rolling. Uh, quote, the Guild claims... Democracy will die in darkness if there are fewer Post employees making the critical journalism that keeps our communities informed and holds our public officials accountable. And, you know, they're not necessarily wrong that some of the work that the Washington Post people do is absolutely phenomenal. Remember, this is going really far back in the day, not saying anything about now. They broke the um, leaks about Vietnam and there were lots of momentous, or sorry, they didn't break the leaks about Vietnam. They broke Watergate is what I meant to say. So obviously there is a value to having Washington Post employees who are hardworking. But when you see a Washington Post article nowadays, what are 50% of them? What are they all saying up at the top? It's Washington Post or Post Opinion. 
a lot of these new articles that you're seeing that are catching mainstream attention are people just putting their opinions down and not actually reporting something, but kind of swaying. So the reason that they have opinion columns is because, of course, we want to hear people who are in these circles. They run with these people. They do the work day in and day out. We want to hear their opinions not trying to you know hate on that in general but when a majority of the reporting at least that gets out there that actually gains traction is the opinion pieces rather than hard investigative work you are doing something wrong you are a newspaper trying to keep people accountable and yes you can do that through opinion but guess what a better way to do that is to do it through hard research, to go in, get the facts, make sure that you have everything well documented rather than just putting something together that's, oh, well, I feel bad, bad about Senator X doing this. Instead of that, go find how it's actually harming people. Go find the people that that policy or the lack of passing a policy is going to harm. Get their voices in there. Do the work instead of just whining about it. And that is exactly what a lot of opinion pieces are, whining about it. It's not true for every single person. It is not true for every single journalist across the entire world, but a lot of them are. And let's be clear, I, I have a good time reading some of them. I, I find them fascinating. They do uh, provide some elucidations sometimes. There is no doubt about that. But most of the time, it is just whining. And you can see why. When you have employees like this who believe that they are valuable simply because they work at the Washington Post, rather than being considered valuable for the work they do, the effort they put in, and what they bring to the table. And at the end of the day, they're going to feel the repercussions of those actions. They're going to get hit hard, and they don't necessarily see it quite yet, but as this strike went basically unnoticed, except for these mocking articles, you can see why it didn't matter. The Washington Post upper management was like, okay, go, go on a break for a day. Yeah, you, you do whatever you want to do, 24 hours, Fine. I don't think people are going to necessarily miss all of your opinion pieces. We'll just rerun some of them. Or we have a few pieces that are already in the works and we'll just publish them. Come on. Uh, the ego on these guys is absolutely phenomenal. And we can all laugh along on the sidelines because at the end of the day, if you are not doing hard-hitting journalism, if you're not seeking the truth rather than giving your opinion, no matter how much you, dis you disagree with what the truth is, how much your ideology doesn't permit it, then you shouldn't be a journalist and you shouldn't pretend that you're all high and mighty. So that's one form of speech that I wanted to talk about nowadays. The one that is kind of pitiful and going downhill and is trying to grasp at the straws in order to keep their hold on the perspective that they're able to project to us about the American system. The next one is about free speech online. And this article comes from Cato.org. Uh, Texas and Florida social media laws violate the First Amendment. So the Cato.org is was kind of conservative. They're libertarian and they're kind of going back and forth and they're objecting to these conservative policies, which, is, okay, actually, you know, I could go on a rant, but I think they're going to say it very eloquently within the first paragraph. So let's jump to that, and then we'll come back to it after I read that. Quote, Two years ago, Texas passed a law declaring that large social media services are common carriers subject to erroneous regulations dictating what speech they must disseminate. The law prohibits services from removing, demonetizing, or blocking a user or a piece of content based on the viewpoint expressed. Services found to violate this requirement face liability for each piece of content they removed. So you obviously, if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, or even just are kind of aware of the conservative side of the argument about how social media is limiting their type of speech, you could see why the conservative states, Texas and Florida, would pass something like this, which is if you have any sort of viewpoint discrimination that we can actually determine, you know, in a legal sense, then we're going to come after you. You're, there's going to be a legal penalty, whether that be a fine or maybe you could be sued by the person that is having their content taken down. So this sort of argument and this sort of practice of bringing these laws about, it really made some conservatives really happy. They're like, yes, Texas, Florida, you guys are standing up for me. The Cato Institute was a little bit libertarian. They still are libertarian, but they've gone more 
mainstream libertarian in that they use their libertarianism in order to detract from not just Democrats anymore, but also conservatives. So that's why you can see them pushing back on this a little bit. And how you're probably thinking, wait, hold on. This is a protection of people's free speech. That's one of the most libertarian things out there. It's actually stopping the big companies from exerting their will on the people. But if you notice the mechanism by which the big companies are being stopped, it is the government, which very much goes against libertarian values. Even, you know, if a big company is discriminating against people in a purely idealistic libertarian world, you would actually have the people be so outraged that they wouldn't use the service anymore. Therefore, having a free market solution that would solve the issue rather than having government have to come in and use their big boot, throw it down on your neck or the company's neck and say, no, 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 you can't uh, get rid of Jimmy Job, Jimmy Bob Joe's post. That's not okay. So you can see where they're at least coming from a little bit here. So they actually filed an amicus brief because uh, a friend of the court brief and it's in front of the Supreme Court right now, and they lay out why they did exactly what they did. Quote, the Supreme Court has granted review of both cases. There's one case for the Texas law and then one for the Florida law. Quote, now NATO, Cato has filed a joint amicus brief supporting Net Choice and CCIA, both of the complainants in the lawsuits, in both cases. There are many reasons why the law violates the First Amendment, but our brief focus is on just one aspect of the Fifth Circuit's decision, its reliance on Prune Yard Shopping Center versus Robbins, a flawed Supreme Court decision that should be overruled. So they go on to explain it, and I'm going to kind of summarize or at least whittle it down a little bit. Quote, the court held that there was no First Amendment injury to the shopping center, because passerbys would not likely believe that the shopping center endorsed the speech of people that were out in front of it. So what they're saying here is, well, at the end of the day, these shoppers, you know, they're seeing all these people out in front of these stores. They have their signs. They're protesting. And just because they're out in front of the stores doesn't mean that the shoppers are like, oh, they obviously believe in this. So therefore, it's unconstitutional for any law to be in place that would say that the shopper, the shopping centers are not allowed to ban these people from going out and protesting in front of them by claiming that it could hurt their business and it violates their First Amendment rights to not have to be associated with any of these sort of free speech activities, which is a very interesting argument. There's no doubt about that. And if you want to go and, you know, do a deep dive on that case and you want to understand the legal precedent, which, let's be clear, not saying I 100% do, you know, it's a very broad brush that I am painting with here. But the idea that when a different company, whether it's an internet company or a social media company, when they have to be liable for the speech on their platform, then they could be sued. This is one of the main things that happened with Section 230, and it's kind of provided this gray area where all of these internet companies live. So right now, what they can do is get away with the fact saying, well, hey, we're a private company, so we can regulate certain speech and regulate certain things if we have it in our uh, code of conduct. But also, if we do take something down and we violate our code of conduct or we're limiting somebody's First Amendment rights, we can't be sued because of that well because you know we're actually not a uh, publisher we're a platform so we we can take things down if they break the rules because people opt in to be a part of our platform but we're not a publisher who says you can't post certain thing or you have to regulate every th single thing that is posted on your website so then the question becomes, in this case specifically, if somebody puts something up on YouTube and YouTube doesn't take it down, does that mean that they endorse it? If you see a really nasty video, but it's all free speech, they're not trying to call out anybody and uh, say that they need to be harassed or there's any you know, calls to action or threat of violence against that person, but it's still a nasty video and YouTube doesn't take it down because it doesn't break their terms of service. Does that mean that YouTube is directly endorsing that video or does it mean that YouTube is allowing speech even if it isn't good speech? Or I take that back, 
good speech is a, a tricky and slippery slope if we start defining speech as good as bad. But does it mean that they're not necessarily going to stop speech that may seem hateful and mean? And, you know, YouTube has taken a different stance on a lot of this, and so have a lot of different internet providers. Some say you can't comment certain things, like Reddit. The, you can have your own independent Reddit page where certain things are not allowed to be said. You have uh, moderators who go through. It is a little bit different because you opt into a particular community there. You opt in to be a part of a place that has particular rules. So it gets really mixed and crazy on these online spaces. And the reason that I wanted to really highlight what's going on here is we're going to have a uh, watershed case that is in front of the Supreme Court. Both of these are going to determine, or at least if the Supreme Court doesn't you know, dance around it and they actually take a firm stance, this will determine how operators on the internet, and I'm talking about the companies, the websites, how all of these different entities are going to have to handle the free speech of individuals even if they don't like it. And that can completely change the way that we look at the internet. It completely override the 230 protections because if they say that companies are liable for speech that they don't take it down, then guess what? These companies are going to crack down. They're going to have these really, really specific terms of service where it says if you violate any of our rules, we have the right to take you off no matter what. And therefore, we're going to have a much more restricted area because people are deathly afraid of actually allowing any sort of speech that could be perceived as hateful by another group. But also, if they take their hands completely off of it, we're going to have a space that, you know, I've used this analogy in a podcast before. It's a pretty simple one. It's going to be the wild, wild west. You can say whatever you want, wherever you want, and if a company takes you down for saying it, then they can get directly sued because they're acting like a publisher when they are simply a platform. So... Be watching out for this case as we go forward. It's really going to shape how this generation and the next generation views the internet. You know, our Gen Z, we have a certain perspective. We kind of grew up in the development stage where you could get away with some nasty things, but some people were trying to roll it in. If you talk to later millennials, they're like, oh, it was the wild, wild west when we first got on the internet. If this court case goes through and it actually sets a really hard precedent, and like I said, the Supreme Court does not dance around it, this could explain or change how the kids that are growing up right now experience the internet and feel about the internet and how much they value free speech or how much they value safety and protection. Or the inverse, how much they hate free speech because they see things they don't like on the wild, wild west internet or how much they hate the safety nanny state system because of how much they're being restricted. We'll see how it all plans out. Just keep your eyes out for it. That's why I wanted to talk about that story. All right. And then we're going to jump to our daily delight. This is our last story. I'm going to make you really, really, I don't want to say cry, but it's going to bring tears of joy to your face because once you see the photos of this guy, absolutely adorable. The article comes from outdoors.com. All we really wanted for Christmas is an adorable baby kangaroo. So if you go to see this photo, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But I'm looking at it right now. So it's a gentleman wearing kind of, I would say, a, a bit higher than his ankle leather boots and a baby kangaroo that does not pass his socks. So it's not even at his calf. This thing is absolutely tiny. It is one of the most adorable things I have ever seen. And this is one of those brief moments when the kangaroo is just outside of its pouch. You know, it's chilling out for a little bit. It spent its a few months in there and now it's trying to get acquainted with the world and then it will jump back into the pouch. And don't worry, don't worry. These uh, rescue guys, they talked about how they actually have a artificial pouch because the poor little baby lost his mother. And it's in a, uh, I'll just read you the quote. The Kangaroo Sanctuary shared the video, and the organization is don a donation-based animal rescue focused on orphaned kangaroos in Australia. And like I said, if you want to find the link to the photos or the videos or any of the articles that we talked about here today, there'll be a link in the description below that like and subscribe button. Also down there, you can find the link to the podcast on Spotify, Pocket Cast, Google Podcast, as well as Podvine. And there's also the Twitter handle, at Your Daily Flip, where I post a Twitter tirade every Tuesday and Thursday. 
you know, it's a lot shorter. It's 10 minutes. It's off the top of my head, less quotes, a little bit less formal, just so you don't have to hear all the new stuff. We can talk about culture things or just values or stupid questions I had. Like the other day is like, has anybody had that existential feeling of boredom before? You know, really, really stupid things. But, you know, I'm young, so I can get away with saying all of this and then in a few years be like, oh, that was my younger self. So if you want to hear any of those uh, weird thoughts, go over there to the Twitter handle. With all that said, there's only one more thing to say. Stay safe. Don't die.